Hey guys, what's going on? It's great to be here with you guys. My name is Jason Silva. I am the presenter of National Geographic's Brain Games TV series. I'm also a digital filmmaker, but the way that I really describe myself is as a wonder junkie, which is a term coined by Carl Sagan, one of my heroes, which is the reason why being at a conference called Wired for Wonder is such a serendipitous trip. So I'm thrilled to be here in Australia with you guys, and let's get started. So I'm a wonder junkie. I'm addicted to wonder. I'm addicted to awe. I'm addicted to marvel at what human beings are capable of. And I'm incredibly passionate about human imagination. I'm incredibly passionate about human creativity. And this has turned into a passion for technology because I believe that technology is the embodiment of human creativity. I believe that technology is the literalization of the human mind in the world. Technology is how we turn our mind inside out. The cognitive philosophers David Chalmers and Andy Clark describe technology as a scaffolding of mind that extends our thought, our reach, and our vision. And it has always been so. 100,000 years ago, in the savannas of Africa, when early hominids first picked up a stick on the floor to reach some fruit that was on a really high tree, we've been using our tools to extend our reach. We've been using our instruments to extend our agency and our volition. Now, today, today we live in a world of disruption. Today we live in a world of accelerating change. We live in a world where it feels like the rug is being pulled from underneath our feet. See, 100,000 years ago, we may have been innovating slowly technologically, but these changes accrued over many, many generations. So back in the day, you were born and you died in a world that didn't change very much. But we don't live in that world anymore. Now we live in a world in which the change is happening within our own lifespans, and that's what makes it so hard to fathom. See, our brains evolved in a world that was linear and that was local. And so our intuition about change is linear. But now we live in a world, as Peter Diamandis likes to say from the XPRIZE Foundation, now we live in a world that is global and that is exponential, a world powered by exponential technologies. But again, our intuition continues to be linear. Our instinct continues to follow this linear trend, when in fact that does not correspond with the world that we live in today. So how do we get over this future blindness? How do we transcend this linear lens that makes it so that we can't quite predict what's happening? Well, there's a great example that Ray Kurzweil, one of my heroes and the head of engineering at Google, uses to very quickly get your head wrapped around the implications of exponential change. He calls it the 30 steps example. Now, if you take 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, where do you get to? You get to 30. That's linear change. 30 steps gets you to 30. Okay, that's our intuition, that's our instinct, that's not how the world works. Now, if you were to take the same amount of steps, those same 30 steps, but each one was exponential, right? You'd go two, four, and by step 30, guess where you are? A billion. Now, this is what starts to blow my mind a little bit. So 30 linear steps gets you to 30. 30 exponential steps gets you to a billion. And technology accelerates at this exponential rate. Now, that's the reason why the smartphone in your pocket today is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than what used to be a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building in size 40 years ago. And according to Kurzweil, you needed special permission to get access to it. So think about that kind of transformative disruption. What used to be half a building in size and cost $60 million has now shrunk down to a device that fits in your pocket that is, in fact, a thousand times more powerful. How does this transform what becomes possible? How does this transform our potential? As the folks of Singularity University likes to say, a young kid in rural Africa 
with this smartphone today has better communications technology than a U.S. president or a head of state had 25 years ago. So the tools to change the world are now in everybody's hands. And these information technologies are continuing to advance exponentially. In the next 25 years, this will shrink down to the size of a blood cell, inter interface directly with our bodies and brains, further reverse engineering us from inside out. So this is what's coming. So the first step, if you want to start making sense of these transformations, is start thinking exponentially about change. And rather than freak out at these disruptions and worry about jobs and so on and so forth, assume we will adapt. And instead, think of this exponential disruption as an exponential opportunity for transformation, for transcendence, for reinvention, right? To incorporate these non-biological props and scaffolds things and redefine what it means to be human. As Marshall McLuhan used to say, first we build the tools and then the tools build us. We are in a symbiotic relationship with technology and it has always been so. When early humans first domesticated fire and first started cooking food, that acted as an external stomach that pre-digested every meal, making every meal more energy efficient, freeing up the cognitive real estate for the development of culture and art and language because we didn't have to spend all day foraging around for raw food. We could cook it. It was, make, it was more energy efficient. There's a book about this. It's called Cooking Made Us Human. So again, think of that metaphor of fire and cooking as all technologies. We've been in a symbiotic relationship with technology since the dawn of man, and it's not stopping. So I'm a digital filmmaker, which means I like to express myself making short films I call philosophical espresso shots that explore a lot of these ideas. Because my goal is to get people excited about technological transformation and excited about disruption. So I'd like to show you some of these clips today as I continue my remarks. So the first video I want to show you is an anthem on the human capacity to overcome our limitations, on the human capacity to surprise ourselves and transcend our limits. So please pull up the first video. To be human is to be transhuman. So there's a great line by Shakespeare in which he says, we know what we are, we know not what we may be. And in the age of accelerating technologies in which we extend the cognitive reach of our minds, the perimeters of our humanness with these extensions of self, these exoskeletons, these technological scaffoldings, you know, the wings of our aircrafts and the signals traveling through our smartphones, sending our thoughts electrified at the speed of light across oceans of sky. We redefine and extend what it means to be human. Edward O. Wilson says, we have actually decommissioned natural selection and now we must look deep within ourselves and decide what we wish to become. We are now the chief agents of evolution. We have reversed engineered the software of biology and are about to rewire and upgrade and redefine what it is to be a homo sapien. Juan Enriquez uses the term homo evolutus, the being that evolves itself, that transforms itself, right? Ray Kurzweil, we didn't stay in the caves. We haven't stayed on the planet. Biology, just another membrane to be transcended. You know, Marvin Minsky used to say, will robots inherit the earth? Yes, they will, but they will be our children. And you know, I love this idea because we hear the term transhumanism and what it means to be human is to be transhuman. We are the species that transforms and transcends. We never stop, we always did, it's what we are. So again, we're talking about exponential change and we're talking about the human capacity to overcome our limits. Now I travel around the world, I try to get people thinking exponentially, we talk about Moore's Law, and people usually will buy it because they'll say, well yeah, I've seen the world change over the last 10 or 20 years, I've seen the computers shrink and get better, so I've seen how digital disruption works, but what about the world of concrete and flesh, right? That physical world in which we live on a day-to-day -day level. Certainly that is not changing exponentially, people say. Well, it turns out that 
it is going to be changing exponentially. So take biology. With biology, what's emerging now is the field of biotechnology. Biotechnology means mastering the information processes of biology, because biology is an information process. We are linguistic beings. DNA is code. We are made of language all the way down. And now we're mastering the capacity to reprogram and author and play with the canvas of life itself. We have truly decommissioned natural selection. The physicist Freeman Dyson, for example, envisions, envisions a very near future where a new generation of artists will be writing genomes with the fluency that Blake and Byron wrote verses. Think about that for a second. Us writing poetry with the substrate of life itself. Life rewriting its own code. Its intelligent design at last. I mean, this stuff is insane. And the field of synthetic biology, for example, gene sequencing right now is accelerating three times faster than Moore's law. So we're progressing three times faster than exponential in our capacity to sequence our genes, right? The guy that created the first synthetic organism, Craig Venter, when he was announcing what he had achieved, they asked, they asked him, are you worried that you're playing God? And he said, who's playing? Which I thought, <laughs> spot on, because that's what's happening right now, right? So healthcare is about to be transformed, personalized medicine. I know the XPRIZE Foundation had a contest for somebody who could design a medical tricorder, smartphone-sized device that could diagnose you better than 10 board-certified doctors. Imagine that deployed in a rural village, lab on a chip technology, apps for biology, quantified self-revolution, reprogramming our genes away from disease, away from aging. Our genes are little software programs. Look, Silicon Valley gets it. There's a reason why Larry Page, founder of Google, created Calico, the California Life Extension Company. He had a Time Magazine cover story called Google and the End of Death. So this stuff is happening. A redefinition of the human being is what's emerging. So that's biotechnology accelerating exponentially. Then you have nanotech. Now this stuff is crazy. I recommend the book by Eric Drexler. It's called Engines of Creation. That's how he describes nanotechnology. With nanotechnology, we can pattern atoms, which are the building blocks of the physical world, the same way we pattern ones and zeros in the digital world. So if you've seen what the repatterning of ones and zeros has achieved in the world of computers, right? Imagine what we can do to matter when we can pattern the bits, the atoms, right, of reality. So matter becomes a programmable medium on the back of nanotechnologies, right? Software that writes its own hardware. Just think about that for a second. So these three overlapping revolutions, like biotechnology, we have nanotechnology, and of course, AI, artificial intelligence, the digital revolution that's going to continue, non-biological thinking, non-biological intelligence continuing to advance exponentially in a symbiotic relationship with our mind, right? We are cyborgs. We have always been cyborgs. Again, we build a tool, the tool builds us, and so on and so forth. These three overlapping revolutions of bio, nano, and AI together coalescing in Silicon Valley are it is said, are leading us towards a technological singularity. And this is a beautiful metaphor because the singularity is a metaphor borrowed from physics to describe what happens when you fall through a black hole. Namely, the laws of physics as we know them get all warped and weird. And so it's a beautiful metaphor to describe what this future is going to be because in a way it's like us trying to explain to a really smart chimp the nuances of Shakespeare why it's so beautiful and poetic and so on and so forth. The chimp is smart. It's real humanoid seeming, but it simply lacks the wetware to conceive of the poetry of Shakespeare. And we too, right, lack the wetware of truly conceiving of what's going to become possible on the back of these technologies. But again, this is not science fiction. This is what Silicon Valley is thinking about. People who understand exponential change realize these are data-driven extrapolations. This is what's happening. So I think the role of the artist is to realize that the future is the present and to use his work to prepare the grounds for it. So please, let's watch the next video, The Future of Us. So let's talk about the future of us. What does that even mean, the future of us? 
It's a look at what comes next. It's a look at what might be. Because today, exponentially emerging technologies are transforming what's possible. They are helping us overcome, transcend, even biological limitations. The very rules of what it is to be human are up for grabs. We're rewriting the software of life with biotechnology. We're turning matter into a programmable medium with nanotechnology. We're creating sentient minds with artificial intelligence that are not bound by the limitations of biology. These three overlapping revolutions, GNR, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics, together will be leveraged to lead us towards a black hole like impossible to fathom singularity. It's like staring into the sun, a moment of a rousing symphonic climax when all of mind leverages the network together, transcends its biological origins, and we become something more. People worry about the AIs and the them. Well, as Kurzweil says, that's going to be us. The future of us is ours to dream up. So, as these technologies continue to power our world, continue to fuel these disruptive, transformative changes, there is some apprehension because it's happening really fast and people get a little bit freaked out and they feel like maybe we're playing God too much or maybe we're fundamentally messing with the natural order of things and so on and so forth. And that comes from this false duality, this false belief that technology is somehow unnatural in some capacity, right? You, you know, nature and then technology. And that, of course, couldn't be further from the truth. Kevin Kelly, he's the co-founder of Wired Magazine. He wrote a marvelous book called What Technology Wants. And he refers to technology, he gave it a better name, he calls it the technium. The technium, according to Kelly, is the seventh kingdom of life. And that it's subject to the same evolutionary forces of biology. That technology sprouted from biology, right? We emerged from the biosphere. Technology emerged from us. Technology is our exoskeleton. Technology is our extended phenotype. We are our technology. Technology is the human mind turned inside out. We just have to change how we think about it. One of the things that Kelly says that totally inspired me was, imagine how impoverished humanity would be if we didn't invent the technology of oil painting in time for Van Gogh to unfurl his genius using that medium. Or if we didn't invent the technology, the musical instrument or musical annotation in time for Beethoven and his genius to unfurl using that medium. So if you think of technology as the great enabler, right, for new forms of human flourishing, new forms of human beauty, new forms of human expression, right, this should change your relationship with this concept of technology. New possibilities, what possibilities might become possible on the back of these tools? When biology becomes our canvas, when the world becomes a programmable medium? Terence McKenna, the psychedelic philosopher, used to say, we live inside the condensation of human imagination. The man-made world is the condensation of human imagination. We literally take in matter of low organization, we put it through the filters of the human mind, and we extrude space shuttles, airplanes, and iPhones. That is what it means to be human. And furthermore, as these man-made systems become more advanced, they're starting to mirror systems found in nature which again reveals this false duality and <laughs> reminds us that it's all part of this emergent sort of evolutionary force, this extropic force, right? That's what life essentially is, right? Life moves towards greater complexity and organization. It's the opposite of entropy in some ways. And so this next video takes a look at the patterns what we're seeing between man-made systems and natural systems to make the case that they're both one and the same. So please show the patterns video. You know, there's a mind-expanding idea that smashes the false duality between nature and technology. The realization that nature and technology are one and the same, a continuum, smack in the middle between the born and the made, is summed up in the lines, to understand is to perceive patterns. 
that moment when the dots connect, you see the gestalt, long view, and you see the big picture. This notion of patterns. For example, Paul Stamets has written about the mycelial archetype and how the information sharing systems that comprise the internet, a man-made system, mirror the neurons in our brain, a natural system, which in turn mirror computer models of dark matter in the universe. They all share the exact same intermingled filamental structure. It's unbelievable. Or for example, the fact that forager ants, when they hunt for food, their patterns of hunting mirror the TCP IP protocols that govern information flow of traffic on the internet. Same patterns. Jeffrey West from the Santa Fe Institute tells us that cities are actually like organisms. They have metabolic rates and that alleys are like capillaries. Fly an airplane, look at a city from the sky. It looks like a motherboard. It looks like a microchip. Information arranged, evolution, life, sentience, mind. To understand is to perceive these patterns. There is no duality between nature and technology. It is all one and the same. All right. So things are getting weird, but also interesting. And having said all that, what does it all mean if we're not going to leverage these transformations and these realizations to make a positive impact on the world? Because that's what it's all about. If we're not using these tools, these new construction kits for our reality, for positive social impact, then we have failed. So I think it's very important for us to become empowered passioned about these ideas, to identify what are we most curious about, right? And then find a space where all these things we're curious about overlap, and that's where there's neurobiology, and that's where there's passion. And then find a need in the world that can be served by your passion, and then passion turns into purpose. I can't emphasize this enough, because if we don't get people impassioned and excited about the potential of these tools and about your potential to use these tools to make a positive impact on the world, then we have failed. So my friend Stephen Kotler, the co-founder of the Flow Genome Project and a New York Times bestselling author, he wrote an article in Forbes magazine about how to find your passion, which I thought was excellent, especially because people often say, well, I don't know what I'm passionate about. Easy for you to say because you're passionate. I'm like, well, there is a formula for this. And so this next video is precisely about how to identify your passion following a very simple formula, and then we'll get to the end after that. So let's show the next video how to find your passion. So there was a wonderful article by Stephen Kotler published in Forbes about how to find your passion. It's a question we ask ourselves every single day. We've all been told that a life of passion is a life that means something. But how do we identify our passions? It's not always easy. So one of the things that Stephen Collar breaks down is that he says that passion essentially exists in the intersection between multiple things that you're curious about. So he says the first thing you should do if you want to identify your passion is to make a list of all the things that you're curious about, all the things that you wonder about. Be as specific as you can and then create kind of a Venn diagram and try to figure out where the things that you're curious about, three or more, intersect. And that's the sweet spot. That's where there is energy. That's where there is dopamine and neurobiology. Multiple streams of curiosity intersect at a space called passion, right? And then once you've identified your passion, then you can figure out how to turn that passion into a purpose. To turn that passion into a purpose, make a list of 15 things in the world, 15 challenges you'd like to see solved. And then figure out which one of those challenges can be served by your passion. So then you see curiosity, leads to passion. Multiple streams of curiosity leads to passion. Identifying problems in the world that can be served by your passion leads to purpose. And then, my friends, you've impregnated your life with a sense of significance, with a sense of meaning. And then you can go forth, my brothers. You can go forth. So there you go, guys. Exponential technology. Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, so my goal is to get you guys impassioned, to use these tools, to take advantage of these disruptions, these exponential opportunities that we have before us to make a positive impact on the world. And 
Basically, a while back, I created a digital campaign to get people really excited about the possibilities for social impact, and we called it the Redefine Billionaire Campaign. And the key idea was, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go through this, but the key idea was that in the age of exponential technologies, our ambitions should be bigger than ever before. So if you consider the fact that now everybody wants to create a startup, everybody wants to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, create a startup, sell it, become a billionaire, and so on and so forth, that how about we redefine this term of being a billionaire to go beyond making a billion dollars? Because that's old school. The new billionaire, the, the idea of redefining billionaire is that today, a billionaire is somebody who comes up with an idea, an algorithm, a software platform, an app, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a piece of biological code that can positively affect the world, that can positively affect a billion people in the world. So the new billionaire is somebody who can come up with an idea that positively touches a billion people, and that this is not outside of our field of possibility, that this is actually within the reach of each and every one of you, that the technologies that we have before us today, these new construction kits for our reality, to repeat the term, mean that each of us have the potential to positively touch a billion people. And so we wanted to put this proof of concept into work, so we decided to make a video on the Redefined Billionaire campaign, shot the video with a smartphone to further show that this message could be disseminated, that these ideas could be electrified and spread at the, at the speed of light using a device that we have in our pockets and see if it might get a billion views. It got well over a million. We didn't get to a billion, but we tried. So uh, excuse the audio quality on this video, but understand that the message is a powerful one indeed, that each of you can positively touch a billion people. It's called Captains of Spaceship Earth. Please show the next video. We live in a world of exponential technological advancement. What this literally means is that we have new construction kits for our reality, new tools with which to probe at the adjacent possible. So consider the implications, right? As Marshall McLuhan used to say, first we build the tools, and then the tools build us. We are designed by what we have designed. There are these feedback loops of mind, tool, and world that radically redefine our boundaries, that radically transform what it means to be human. To be human today is to crisscross the skies. To be human today is to create techno-social wormholes, mind-to-mind -mind communication that overcomes the limits of time, the limits of time, and, time and distance. And so what do we do? Well, we need to radically reach out to one another in ways that we haven't before. There's a great line that says, empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. In other words, if it's out of sight, it is out of mind. But if anything, these wireless communication technologies are radically extending our line of sight. They're providing new ontological maps of the real. They're giving us the astronaut overview effect. We are seeing the big picture. We are seeing that we are the captains of spaceship Earth. And what shall we do? We need to extend our hands to one another. We've never had such tools to overcome all of the limitations of our humanity. We have the power, we have the will, we have the capacity, the creative capacity to overcome our limits. And so today, billions of us linking to one another, creating a global node, a global brain. What is the new definition of billionaire? The new definition of billionaire is he who will positively affect the lives of a billion people. He or she who will reach out and say, I will positively affect the lives of a billion people. This should be our goal. This is our responsibility. Whew. Here's our chance. It's a good message, right? We can do this. Thanks, guys. Now, I call my videos shots of awe, and I call myself an awe junkie, a wonder junkie, and we're wired for wonder. And why is wonder and awe so important? And this is really the last message. There's been a lot of research at Stanford and Berkeley and other places around the world on the therapeutic benefits of awe and wonder. And in these studies, they describe awe as an experience of such perceptual expansion, such perceptual vastness, right, that you have to reconfigure your mental maps of the world in order to assimilate the experience. So think of the first time you saw images of the Hubble Space Telescope or the 
first time you saw the Grand Canyon or the first time you saw an Airbus A380 double-decker taking off. The point being, there's no references for what you're seeing. And so your mental maps of reality need to be reconfigured. And during these ecstatic moments of awe, these exhilarating neurostorms of intense intellectual pleasure, it turns out that after these moments pass, we are left with these residual and lasting cognitive benefits, increased creativity, increased compassion, increased well-being, not to mention anti-inflammatory effects and a reduction in cortisol. So blowing our own minds is therapeutic. <laughs> so this, this, this event you're here today for, this is a spa for the mind. This is good for your brain and soul. And so thank you for being here, guys. Hope you have a wonderful night. See you guys soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.